Hello, my name is Michelle, and you're listening to Profit is a Choice. On the podcast today is Emma Carroll Paradise and Kim Carroll, the owners and designers of Impeccable Nest based in Bedford, New Hampshire. They are a mother and daughter team with a love of design. Originally from a beach town in California, now in New Hampshire, they bring a Southern California cool and a New England tradition to their design. Emma and Kim are going to share with us the unique challenges of starting a business together as well as living together. We will hear some of the beautiful ways that they each have stretched and grown to be able to work well and live well. A partnership like this takes work, and each of these women bring a lot to the table. I was hugely inspired by the way they support each other, love each other, and allow each other to grow and change, and I know you will be too. If you are in or anticipate any type of partnership, and especially a partnership with family involved, this is an honest conversation and one that might just prepare you to take the next step. Every day, empowered entrepreneurs are taking ownership of their company financial health and enjoying the rewards of reduced stress and more creativity. With my background as a financial software developer, owner of multiple businesses in the interior design industry, educator and speaker, I coach women in the interior design industry to increase their profits, regain ownership of their bottom line, and to have fun again in their business. Welcome to Profit is a Choice. Hey, Emma. Hey, Kim. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Michelle. Hey, Michelle. Thank you for yeah. having us on. We're we super excited. This. Yeah. Oh, I'm excited too. And um, we met at the Boston Design Center, correct? Yes. Yeah. And we saw you there with um, a speaker engagement. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We were um, doing a panel discussion. Yes. And um, I, I had the wonderful pleasure of meeting you. And I want to share with the listeners, I shared a little bit in the intro um, on your bio that you are a mother-daughter team. And we're going to kind of talk about some of the nuances of not only um, having a business where we're coming in with a partner, Mm -hmm. but then the added layer of a family member in that mother or daughter relationship, because I think that is super interesting. And like I mentioned to you in a pre-conversation, I have other clients who have been mother, daughter um, partnerships as they've, they've done this business. So I'm going to let you all start and tell me, um, either of you can jump in and go first. Tell me a little bit about yourself, your business, and how you got started. Well, thank you. We are a mother-daughter residential interior design partnership here in Bedford, New Hampshire. We're actually originally from Manhattan Beach, California. So yeah, we made our way from Southern California. Uh, We weren't interior designers at that time. I came because both my daughters decided to go to school in Boston, so I followed and we located in New Hampshire. That's how we find found our way here mm-hmm. from California to New Hampshire. But I'm getting also, ready to ask you how you got from West Coast yeah, to East Coast. Everybody does. I usually have to have a standard a- answer um, about that because people think we're just, just Nuts. plum crazy that we're in New Hampshire and we left the beautiful weather of Southern California. And there are times that when it snows, I think, why am I here in New Hampshire also? But sure. um, what it does is it lends a lot to our business. We're very Southern California melding with a New England look. We had spent a lot of time being on both sides of the coast, so we were familiar with both sides. And it, I think we draw a lot from our style from both of those geographical locations. Mm-hmm. So we're kind of California cool with a New England classic. It lends to our style. Yes. But yes, I followed my daughters to New England and um, here we are. And and yeah, we started our (laughs) business. I think that's interesting. I mean, we get, we could do a whole nother podcast just on West coast meets East coast. (laughs) Coast meets West coast, right? Yes. It is a big topic. Besides the mother daughter, how can you work with your mother or how can you work with your daughter? Um, (laughs) It's why did you leave California? Most everyone else is going from here to California and, and we're the opposites. I That's guess. funny. That's funny. Yeah. So when did you start your business? So you moved from California to follow your daughters there in college. You get to New Hampshire. What what was it that had you begin this yeah. business together? Interior design is a second career for both of us. Yes. 
Okay. Emma, and Emma sort of started at first and I kind of, I've always known that I, um, I'm a nurse by, uh, I've been a nurse for over 30 years. Um, but I always knew I have a practical side of me and I also have a very creative side. And I always told myself that I would probably never retire, but I hope to use the creative side of me later in life. So Emma really asked me to go to a class with her at the design center and you can take it from there. Strangely, it all actually started with an interior design course at the local art um, school here in Manchester, New Hampshire. And a friend of mine, I was a high school teacher. I taught history and foreign languages and we just wanted something else to do. So we took a design course and one course turned into us getting the cert going into the certificate program and getting the certificate and then asking ourselves, now what? And so we decided to launch into creating our business, Impeccable Nest. And to be honest, I never knew interior design was actually a career. <laughs> um, I can appreciate I that. Like, I, I just didn't. I've always moved around my furniture a lot. I've always been a part of the arts. I thought of what I would be doing would be painting or writing. I didn't think it'd be interior design. So when she asked me to go, I'm like, oh, I'd like to, I buy all those magazines. So I fell in love instantaneously. I thought, wow, this is actually an awesome way for uh, traditional arts and yes, your home. I thought the marriage of the two things, what could be better is art and, and your home life. Mm -hmm. I, I really, I really took to interior design. I think that's interesting, Kim, when, um, when I was looking to go to college, I'm from a small town in South Carolina. It was a mill town and there wasn't a lot of extra money floating around. There, there was no interior designer in town that I knew of. I'm not saying there wasn't one there. I had not been introduced to that as an option, as a field of study. I, I it's it not just for the very, very wealthy or, it, for it was, yeah. but not for everyday folk. You just That's decorate right. your house yourself, right? Exactly. Had never. And, because I grew up in a mill town, everybody could sew. And oh, it was a yeah. very DIY community because yep. that's what you did. You just made use of what you had. And so everybody could make everything on their own. I mean, they, everybody had a sewing machine. Everybody knew how to sew. Mm -hmm. So there was, you know, it, I was super creative. I thought yeah. mine would have been more towards painting or writing the same right, kind of thing. Right. That there would be some version of creative expression. And I had done small businesses while growing up. I mean, I painted things on people's sweatshirts and they paid me. Like, I mean, all yeah, kinds of yes, stuff. Yes. We're talking back in the 80s, 70s, maybe. Same here. Yeah, I did you know, I made, I made money French braiding the high school girl's hair. I was in middle school. <laughs> and they would come to my house before date night and sit down and I would French braid their hair and they'd pay me $5 and they'd leave. So I was one of those. I could have been a YouTube success if I had known. But yeah, definitely. Just saying, I didn't even know interior design existed, and I worked in software development, um, as you all probably know. And while I worked in software, I went at night to Oglethorpe University and took design classes, the same kind of thing that you're mentioning. And I never went all the way through a program, but I did go there and start taking just classes to, right, to kind right. of just for my own benefit, just because I wanted to know the theory behind the things that right, I was already right. kind of doing that made sense to me. I took a cake decorating class. I used to sell cakes that I made and decorated. I'm telling you all kinds of stuff. Oh, I've done all of that the same yeah. year, same year. years ago. Exactly. So yeah. I have this yeah. real logical side that building software and very business analyst. And then I had this urge to create. And um, so, so I, I'm just saying, I think we're similar age groups and it just wasn't something that it was, I don't yeah, even know if had an option. But you never thought of as a career that you can yes. make money, that you could support a family on, on this yeah. thing. No idea. No yeah. idea. It wasn't until probably into the nineties before it even came on my radar as something that could have potential. And so I, I just Stewart wanted, was, I just wanted to support you in that. Yeah, I'm, Martha Stewart was like the, like, Oh my goodness. She's, making money in a career. She's a businesswoman with just focusing on the home. Yes. Yeah. Right? And you just, so, it's just not what it was. So, right. Exactly. Okay. So you both get your certificate. You start the impeccable nest. Um, when you started it, did you start off with a full business plan, a financial plan, a marketing plan? 
So no, a plan to plan. <laughs> um, I hate to say it, but no, um, we actually ended school in June and this was seven years ago and I became pregnant shortly thereafter. I actually quit teaching, got my certificate and was expecting my first child. And we had heard so much about high point, you know, we were kind of struggling with what do you do? Do you hang out a shingle? You know, how do we go about this? And we decided to, you know, invest in ourselves. And we went down to high point to really experience what this design trade was all about. And that kind of really started things. Yeah. Cause in school, there's like a, a, a not even a whole semester on focusing on how to have an interior design business. It was maybe a class and they brought in a expert out there to talk about making your logo very lightly about a website, totally. but no real hands on about it. Nothing at all on social media. So you kind of just got dropped out of the program. You got color theory and um, learning about the principles and elements and historical, but not really what you do. How do you walk, leave that with a certificate? And how do, so we walk back into our living room like, now what? Yeah, they, the programs are great when they teach you how to design and decorate. Yes. What yes. they don't do is teach you how to be an entrepreneur in the business owner. Correct. Right? Exactly. Yeah, I, I go in and speak to some of the local community colleges and, and um, universities in my area. And I go in and bring the business aspect. Like, you know how to do this. How many of you are thinking you might go out on your own? And maybe 25% of the room will raise their hand. And the other 75% are either going into commercial or they are going into work for another firm. That's, they want to go almost apprentice for a little while. But there's always a good 20, 25% that thinks they want to hang their shingle out immediately. And they have no business acumen whatsoever. And I mean, that was one of the reasons that I created my coaching system and, you know, my designers inner circle and some of these other elements is to teach that because they're coming out of school with skills on where to put a light and where to put an outlet, but no idea how to do the social media and how to do, or even what it is they need to do to get started. And even nowadays, there's even so many like yourself and everyone else that are being teachers and mentors and workshops. There's more of that available yes. than it was when we started. We oh, yes. So one of the things we did was the only thing I could think of to do was, well, we just can't put on our shingle outside of our living room and say we're open for business. So we actually got together a small amount of money that we could, I guess, lose. That was right. how much can we stand to lose on our bit and betting on ourselves. And we opened a, a home decor shop thinking that if we had a shop, people can see our aesthetic and then parlay that into jobs. Because as we said, we're from Southern California and we live here in New Hampshire. And um, we looked at that as being a little bit of an obstacle. There's people in communities because they're born and raised, you know, they have this natural network. The of old people. model of interior design has been word of mouth. And we didn't have that. We're not from here. We didn't have a bunch of friends and locals. They didn't know us. And again, a lot of the, the old model, which we're embracing the new model because anything goes nowadays, but the old model was word of mouth. The more people you knew, the more connected you were, the more successful you were as an interior designer. And that was hard for us. So that's where we opened the store. Yes. So let me make a comment about that because that could be an obstacle for any designer, whether it's mother-daughter team or an individual, and even if they've grown up in an area because... If you don't have friends and social connections that can purchase your, you yep. know, your offerings. And I see this a lot with what um, we have kind of hashtagged in the industry, baby designers, mm -hmm. many of them, their friends can't buy from them because their friends can't yeah. afford them. Yep. Right. So you're a baby designer selling to people. Yep. Mid thirties, forties and up who actually have the income. So if all of your friends, are the same age as you and cannot afford what you're offering, you still have to have those kind of inroads for the word of mouth for either the, the areas of your town that can afford. I mean, th there's still those connections that have to be made. And I see a lot of that struggle. Or when you've got, um, I know I've worked with military wives. 
that are in design and the husbands are moving. And so they are constantly having to try to get back into a community and it makes it very, very difficult. It It does. So I think we can't underestimate word of mouth. But we also know that you can't only depend on word of mouth. Yeah. And and the beautiful thing is these days with social media, we don't have to. You're right. Years ago, it's that a was whole all we had. Now. Yeah. yeah. Like it. It's funny. The struggles we had seven years ago with starting are not the same struggles we have now at all. And the playing field because of social media is a so game changer. Different. A game changer. It, totally. it, when we embrace social media... Uh, and what we mean by blogging and Instagram, Facebook lives, Facebook lives Insta stories, um, our world opened up. Yes. More so than I think the school. The school gave us the feeling that. Like we're certified. Yeah. Yeah. It gave me the confidence to go we're do what incredible. you need to do. Incredible. Incredible. You, you, you've kind of learned uh, the, the business aspects, boots on the ground, right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Totally. And you know what's even crazier? I can't believe I'm admitting this for the first time. I also have an MBA. <laughs> <laughs> she did. I did. Okay. paid for it, you know. You paid for it, yeah. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm certified. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. But, you know, even my formal training does not, it does not prepare you for being your own boss and an entrepreneur. I can hold my own in, like, a str- strategic management meeting. However really creating all of this from nothing. I mean, that's boots on the ground and it's very different. I love that you brought that up too, Emma, because I've shared and I shared at Lou and live event and some other places, you know, I, I have a degree in management information systems, administrative management. I built financial software for Dun & Bradstreet. (laughs) And then I still struggled doing the financials and doing a plan in my own entrepreneurial business. And and I've heard so many people say the same things. And it's because we've, we've been taught and we've learned how to work within the confines of somebody else's business. But also when it's all yours to do, content creation, and strategy yeah. and the management and the metrics. Yeah. And and it is like a ping pong, like oh, a, yeah. a pinball yeah. machine in your head. You know, the marketing part of your head says you should do this and the financial piece says, but what about this? And it's like you've got this split personality. Yeah. You know, oh, absolutely. And you make a decision and then you second guess yourself and then you third guess yourself. And uh, it's just a very different, there's no amount of education that kind of can help you work through that in the, I would say in the generic way that it's offered. They now have, okay, back to Kim's point where we said that they used to not have interior design as a major degree program. Mm-hmm. They also did not have entrepreneurship. And a yeah. lot of our colleges yeah. and universities now are offering an entrepreneurial path and Correct. teaching them how to think and how to plan and how to strategize and how to build something from nothing. I wish I had had that. And, yeah. and it wasn't available. No, it. you're right. I got an A in accounting, and I have a bookkeeper managing all of our accounting systems. And marketing was a real struggle for me in business school. And now I'm becoming a master marketer with Kim. And it's so crazy. You're so right. Um, and it's been fun because one of the classes I taught as a high school teacher was intro to business. And I encouraged my high school students to start their own businesses and they did and they're doing and they're thriving. So I actually am getting my confidence, strangely enough, from them. Sure. By sharing it and watching it. So do you all still have your store or did you close that? Have you morphed into it? Yeah. So the good news about the store is that it did the trick in getting our name out there and people coming in and learning about us, learning about our aesthetic. The bad news was we couldn't juggle both. As the interior design, the jobs came, we couldn't keep the store open. And the truth is, I did neither one of us wanted to be a shop girl. So, and we also, at that point, were leery about bringing employees on and managing hiring there. When we were just enjoying doing interior design. design jobs and she was I had she, my she had, second her, child she had her second child and that's when we decided we needed to close the store and move in the house and work out of our home and um 
focus on the design jobs. So it had done its trick. We just could not sustain both, both things. We were closed more than we were open. So, you know, that we can have a whole, again, another whole podcast just on that. <laughs> yeah. Right? right. Because I mean, I've got clients this way and I know that we've seen it all over the place. There was a day where having that retail shop was the yeah. bread and butter. That was the word of mouth. Yeah. yeah. It brought things in. But most people now will tell you in a retail environment, I'm not saying all, but I would tell you most, the majority of their work is still design work. And the part that drains the business is the retail. It yeah. is a drainer these days. People mm -hmm. might come in and look around and then they're going to go hit online. I mean, they've yeah. just, we've kind of taught ourselves some really bad shopping behaviors. Um, if or hiring, if we yeah. have hope to keep retail open. And then hiring people, and if you're not in the store, you can't sell your services like an employee. And then it would, we would just be turning into managing people. And, and that's, that's what happens when the firm grows. We, it's not right. where we could put our focus at the time. But it well, didn't do its job. Right. Because we didn't know what else to do, to, how to get the word out there. And so much so that within the first two weeks of being open, a woman walked right in and said, can you do my kitchen and living room? I have no budget. So I'd say we were successful. We actually got a dream job, <laughs> like really the first week of having our place. The like, big fish that you heard about yeah. in design school, we received. That's amazing. <laughs> that, that is amazing. So, you know, I can really appreciate that, that as you know, with profit is a choice, you made a choice to open it. I love how you stated we put in the amount of money that we're both willing to lose. Yep. And it's not that you thought you were going to lose it, but you had to be willing to risk it. Yes, Business right. is taking a risk, yes. yep. but you also did your homework. You knew how to set it up and how to start it. You had already both had a certificate. So you had some work behind you. You didn't just one day wake up and think, I think I go like to sink a hundred thousand dollars in opening a store and I know nothing about what I'm doing. Right. I mean, right. You didn't do that. Right. Yeah. So, so you went into it with a choice. Mm -hmm. And then I love how when you realize that the, the store was profitable in getting your name out there, because we talk about profit being more than money, right? I mean, we want the money. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but, but profitability is about more than the money. And so if I understand your journey correctly, you started the store, you were profitable in getting your name out in the community. You were profitable in landing the big fish, as you call it, for one yeah. of your clients, which is amazing. And when you realize that the store was no longer profiting you in the same way, it was actually now hindering you from yeah. being more profitable with your yeah. time, your resources and your energy. And it sounds like it wasn't your dream to be a retailer. It was your yeah. dream to be designers. Correct. And so it was shifting you from profitably, if you will, using your skill set or and even your passion the way you wanted to did is that about right no that's that's exactly no. that's spot on i mean we love buying things but <laughs> 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 buying and shopping and opening and decorating the shop but then having to show up on mondays and opening up we we, we didn't want to do that well and i think the other thing was is we were growing this business at the same time i was growing my family so i have three kids they are currently six four and two so we're busy and I, you know, we had to make a choice and making the choice to close the store was really the easiest and best choice we could have made. And, you know, it was never a loss. We still have the product. We've been able to use them. We did a really great job of curating a great selection, but then we just shifted. And part of the reason we shifted is I didn't want to put, you know, nothing against people that have to put my kids in daycare. I was able to raise my children through these times. Um, my mother's been a lot here alongside me. My kids are with us all the time. And so it was about raising a family and building a business. So we just had to pivot at that point. Because when you talk about profitability isn't always um, revenue and making money, profitability can be focused on success in different ways. Like ours was the family mm -hmm. being able to be there for those moments with the kids. And when we were finding, we were pulling away from those um, values or our tenets of why we made our business together, why we work together. Um, it, when we felt we were pulling away from those sort of values that we started the business, we always needed to regroup and relook at them, look at our goals. And so one of the things for us was, being able to be there 
for my grandchildren and her children. That's a huge thing in why we started the business. And so profitability was in some days when we look around at our losses and, and gains, we're not where uh, other people are. Maybe we're not making as much, but then we have to look at it and go, wait a second. We were able to be there when they were sick. We were able to go to those dance recitals, you know, so there's some sacrifices financially on the business, but some gains can be measured in what we set out to do with our business. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of refocusing when we think we haven't obtained what we want to do. And those will change through the years. I mean, that's the great thing with little kids. The, the needs, their needs are going to change where we our focus on our business can change. And so I think we heard a great line and it stayed with me from Amber Lewis. Amber Interiors. Amber Interiors. When she spoke, we listened to her. Because um, one of the greatest things to help us fill in the education that we didn't get from school were these podcasts. We're going to conferences, talking to people who are walking the walk and doing it every day. I can't, if I were to stress one thing for new people starting out that are like us when we left school that were just floundering, sign up for that. Go. Meet these people, meet these conferences, go to your design center, talk to the speakers, sign up to be in a podcast, start a podcast. <laughs> There's so many avenues now um, and, and approaches to interior design and how to be successful. But um, now I lost my Amber I, Lewis. Amber Lewis. She said, don't um, compare your beginning with someone else's middle. Yeah. So if you're thinking you're not good enough, are you comparing your beginning stage to someone else's middle? And I think what I would add is not only that, their goals – their profitability may not be the same as yours. So what you're I, I seeing, agree. Right? Yeah. When you're seeing, and okay. you're calling yourself a failure, you don't know what their aim is. Our aim is, the, right? And so you're feeling down on yourself because you don't know where, so we're not all comparing apples and oranges. We're not apples and oranges. We're, we're all different. We're all different, anything in the group. So you can't really stop comparing yourselves you know, and think about what it is profitability is for you. I totally agree. And, you know, it's interesting because in, in my practice, I've worked with people that are coming in that maybe are caregivers for their parents mm -hmm. in addition to caregivers for their children. I have some that are coming in, they maybe have a retired spouse. And so their time is different. I have some that have autoimmune disorders, which means the time in their business is different. And then I have some that this is the main income for their family oh. and oh. everything in between. And so we all have to build our business in a way that fits. I love you mentioned your why and your values. I love, and I've spoken so many times about the Simon Sinek. It starts with why. Yeah. Know your why. Because then you don't get as easily pulled astray right. by looking at the highlight reel of everybody else's yeah. life. Yeah. And it's, it's all very different. I started my business in 2000 with, with very small children. I think mine were two and five, two and a half, five, something like that at the time so that I could stay home and raise my children and have a business that was creative that brought in money to relieve some of the stress in our household off my husband, but doing something that I loved. Mm -hmm. And so we made the choice as a family, my husband and I did to hold my business back some right. so that I could still be mom. And then right. as they grew, my business has expanded. And now I kind of look at it and I've shared this before. I kind of have maybe five to 10 years here. Like my oldest is graduated and out my youngest is going into senior year of college I might have another five to seven years before I may have to shift and start going in and helping care for my parents right. and so you know or grandchildren I mean who yeah. knows what could happen and yeah. so my business is at a high high level right now but it's not what it was mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that if I had been in desperate need of every dollar that it wouldn't have been different back then right. But right. that wasn't the decision I had to make. That wasn't the constraints around our family life. And so I love that. And, and to have a profitable home and to raise children that are good citizens for society, right. to me, that's profitable. I'll take that over the dollars any day, any day. But 
However, caveat, yeah. <laughs> for the hours that I'm going to work, I want yeah. to be paid fairly. That That's totally. my main thing. I, I might not make Absolutely. the same amount somebody else makes, but I want to be paid fairly for the time, effort, and energy that I can put towards the business. Mm -hmm. And we're ready to pivot and want more. I mean, right. we're not, we're not, the sky well, you're not done cool. yet. We're not, no. we're totally not done yet. You're yes, just getting we are, started. <laughs> we are, we just started. We exactly. are baby designers in the sense that we feel like we're one half of an employee each. <laughs> you know, sometimes it feels like we're job sharing. And so, you know, I'm starting to now get my kids in a really great spot that I can start to then pivot and actually give more attention to our business. And strange, you know, strangely as the universe would have it, that is what's happening. Things are becoming easier um, they're becoming more self, they're becoming more independent, which allows us more time to work. Yeah. So I, let's jump into the mother daughter aspect of this. Um, this is the, not that all of that wasn't yummy because we could still, <laughs> but how I think that stuff is good to hear because you can get down on yourself thinking you're not doing as well. As long yeah. as you take stock of what, where did you want to be? Sometimes it's more nuanced, your success and your profitability. And Kim, I would also add to that, I think it's super important to realize where you started. Yes. yes. Because quite often we're always measuring where we are to where we want to go, yes. not where we've come from. Right. And so one of the exercises that, that I have my clients do is tell me what things looked like a year ago. Tell me where you were five years ago. Tell me what you knew. And let's look at where you are. Let's celebrate the success that you have attained to get here. And let's use that as a confidence builder for where we're going to go next, as right. opposed to always feeling like we're behind. We're only behind if we think we're behind. Right. Correct. Right. Behind what? Yeah. Behind what? I mean, yeah. Come on. yeah. All right. So here, here's my question for you. Um, Emma, you made the comment. I think you made it. We feel like we're each like a half a designer. And then Kim, you piped in and said it feels like we're job sharing. So yeah. Let's talk about that. Now, number one, it, it, it is because you two do life together and you do business together and you're also working around family. So yeah. I, I get that nuance, but I want to talk a little bit about what are the highs and lows of working as a mother daughter team? Cause I know there are some people out there listening who are like, there is no way I in know. this world. I know. And then there are others who are going, Oh my gosh, my mom and I would be such a great team again and probably everything in the middle while I could handle her for one day a week said either you know, one. <laughs> it's funny you say that because I come from the aspect of how could it not be awesome being with somebody that you, that you know so well starting out a job, but I'll tell you the first thing out of everyone's mouth is, Oh my God, I could never work with my mother. Right. That's more what I get from everybody. We actually just heard from a woman, it's our electrician's wife, who said, I would love to work with my mom. And that was the first time I've heard that from anybody. It's usually the, you know, saying like, oh, I could never, um, which is crazy because I think everyone should know we don't, right, we do like, we live together and we work together. So there is a lot of mother daughter. There's a lot of together in that. There is a lot of together. <laughs> I mean, oh yeah, there is a lot of together. But we wouldn't do it if it didn't work. Um, you know, Kim has this line where, and professionally I refer to her as Kim, not mom. So I try to delineate the two worlds as sure. much as I can um, for myself and for her as well. No one knows you better than your mother, like than I do. So I didn't really like when she, or she, whenever she said that until I became a mother. And it's really true. She actually knows my strengths and my weaknesses better than probably I do. But now I'm nearing a certain age that I think I'm becoming pretty sure of myself and what my strengths and weaknesses are. Um, however, she knows how to push me to be better and push me to be stronger and she also knows when to jump in if she notices something that I may not be voicing that I'm struggling with. I so think, it yeah. works well. I think the positives can also be the negative, yes. meaning I could use a lot of shorthand and I, and uh, where if you were working with a, a business partner, maybe there'd be more distances and maybe there'd be more um, 
I was going to use the word politeness, but <laughs> I'm always polite to her. But there's some shorthand that I can do as a mother that probably I really shouldn't do in, on a day-to-day basis. Like if, if you were my mother, it's you a familiarity. It's a familiar, yes. yes, it's a familiarity. But then on the other hand, there are days that that familiarity is the best thing of why it's working together. So it's pos- the same things that are positive are, can be a negative depending on which side of the bed we will, either one of us woke up on that day, I think. Um, Truthfully, the, I always say the highs are high, the lows are low. You know, just like any other mother-daughter relationship, mother-daughter relationship that exists. Um, fortunately for us, we have way more great days than we do bad days. Um, my husband mm-hmm. likes to not be around on some of those bad days. <laughs> but usually- Yeah, because you live together. So it's not like you get to go home and get away from whoever in the office irritated you that day. You literally have to take them home with you. We're always irritating each other all day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, we can't leave it if we're irritating. I think that's we're the, there. The worst part of it is sometimes we can have an argument that's based on our personal relationship and how we act out. We may say we need to dissolve this business. But it really has nothing. Our business life is actually really good. It's our personal life that I'm just annoying her like most mothers annoy their daughters. And then we say. There's a flow over. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, there isn't a, you know, the lights go on at 8 a.m. This were Emma and Kim working together. Mm -hmm. And then we close at 5 p.m. And their mom and daughter. It's all blendy. So, so that's bad too. The good news is we've been doing this for a very long time. Basically always. Yes. About 40 years. So (laughs) So, um, (laughs) I don't think the two of us are going to be separating anytime soon. And I think that's, yeah. I mean, Kim brought up about like dissolving the business. I mean, we'd be fooling and lying to people if we didn't say it wasn't hard at certain times. And I think it's when you move from your why and kind of get further away from what is our business all about and who are we all about? And I find for myself, the further we get from that, the harder it is, you know, it feels like the wheels are coming off, you know, and we're a little, you know, just not on the same page. So we like in any business though, you know, you kind of have to snap it back together and be like, what, what's our purpose? So Yes, you tend to. And I just share that as proof to everyone out there that think that we share the same brain and we're just a perfect melding (laughs) of each other. We do have those moments where what are are we in this for? So that's just to show that there's the human side of it because everyone thinks, my gosh, you guys are so in sync with each other. And I wish I had that with my mother. And I'm like, oh, oh, that's, yeah, we're very much in sync with each other. Mm -hmm. But on another end, What we get about solopreneurs is they don't have anyone to bounce it off their ideas and they're all alone. So even though in the beginning when we were talking how hard it is, you're, you're, you finished your school. How do I start my business? Most people are all by themselves. Like, should I do this? How do I do this? I think we have a built in, like, though we were both novices, we still had someone always to bounce things off. And for our clients, that's they better. get two designers. Um, we have something for de- called designer for a day and they get both of us. And you, it, you, we just went, a sh- someone shows a shopping day. Mm-hmm. So we went shopping with a, um, a client and they get two of us and they get to see us both. Like, how about this? How about that? They're, they're getting, they're seeing that bouncing off. So they're getting a product kind of two designers have really, vetted it and thought about it and brought something in and more bang for their buck really yeah and then we're not alone right and a couple of things that are spinning in my head as as you share that for some reason i think that by and large we have this idea that the mother-daughter relationship or the father-son relationship should just be born out of the fact that you're family and that you love each other and whatever. Right. But if somebody were to say to you, um, you know, Emma and your husband, what an awesome relationship. 
they would expect that the two of you had to work at it all day, every day, constantly mm -hmm. to be kind, to be loving, to be respectful, to stay on the same family path, the same family why, carry the same family values. Like yeah. we look at marriages, and we understand by and large that they're work. And yeah. we understand that there is a certain amount of, you know, you, we used to hear that each of you needs to give 50%. And now, of course, you hear that, no, you each have to give 100%, 100%. or 110. And yeah. In other words, it takes both of you constantly working. And the relationship between spouses morphs and changes. What I am saying is that the same thing is really true of this mother-daughter relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Just because you birthed her doesn't right. mean... Oh, it's no. a beautiful, loving relationship. You both, you, you were in a business marriage together. And yeah. so the same way that you see the tensions between, uh, you know, a husband, wife or spouses, you can see the same tension between two people that are in a business marriage together, whether you're mother, daughter or equal partners or whatever. You have to choose to stay, come back to the why. You have to choose yeah. to stay with this, within the same values. You have to choose to allow the other person to be heard and seen. You have to choose to not always be right and to choose relationship over rightness. And so I, I want to point that out. When other people say they couldn't do it, you guys are doing it. And I love how you both have shared, but it's not without intent to, yes. to do it life together and business yes. together well. It doesn't just like one day you hatched and like life is beautiful and you guys never right, have to. Right, right. I mean, it'd be great if that would happen. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Right? But I'm just saying whether it's mother daughter or whether it's two partners, we have a choice to have a profitable work environment by choosing to come together on the project, by choosing to come together with ideas, by choosing to come together with our talents and to let the other person shine. And I also love Emma, how you made the comment that sometimes if you can't either express yourself or you're holding back, your mother steps in. I can almost see the mothering aspect of I'm going to shore up my little girl. She's not, gonna, <laughs> you know what I mean? So there's this business aspect of let's make sure it gets said and done. But there is a mothering aspect that comes in that says, that's my daughter and she can do this and you can do this, honey. Come on. I mean, I can see that and I can bet that Emma, you turn and do the same thing for Kim. You encourage her and support her. Mom, I know you can do this. Yeah, I like to think I do. You and know what's funny is oh I think dear. she does it more for me nowadays. <laughs> really? Okay. I actually do. <laughs> well, and I think that you're, both of you, your prior careers are super helpful for what you're doing. I, I've seen a lot of nurses move into this because if you think about it, when you're walking into a design disaster, you're in triage, girl. You are yeah. trying to figure out what's happening. Stop the bleeding. Where does it hurt? What don't you like? How can I fix it? And then when you look at it from the educational standpoint that Emma brings to the table, you're immediately going in and saying, let me educate you on why we chose this product for you. Let me educate you on the value and the quality of what we're putting in front of you or why this design works. And so you both have these beautiful, external skill sets that you have brought into this that I think marry together and I think they support each other that actually create this beautiful blended team that you have. Yeah, because I, 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 I agree. Sometimes in the beginning, you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm starting from scratch when you're using, you have a second or third, even third career in your life. But all your experiences are a culmination of everything that you are. And interior design is so much education. You're always educating your client. The other is reading your client. And when, as a nurse, I'm educating. As a teacher, you're educating. As a teacher and a nurse, you're reading your client to read their, their, their facial expressions, trying to get a feel for where they are so that you can communicate fully with them. So both of those professions require those. An interior designer needs to do both of those really well also. I mean, what do people say? You know, you go into the meeting, it's, you know, 90% being able to be like part like psychologist and business and 10% is actually about the design. And, you know, I mean, it, a lot is business, but the psychology that goes into, oh it my is. goodness. And you, you, great you, at you that. Really, so helpful. say that again, please. Kim is great at that. It's so helpful because I can be a little obtuse sometimes. 
That's funny. I'm picking up on something. I'm just older and wiser. But she's able to be better. like, stop talking, stop it. <laughs> stop. Let's address this. But let me ask you this. So um, when you started working together, did you do a lot of planning in advance for how the business relationship would work? Did you decide that, okay, so you're going to take the lead sometimes, I'm going to take it, we're going to come in as equals? Did you have a discussion to what happens if we don't agree? Like, did you try to put some boundaries around coming in or did you just kind of come in with none of that and just let it fall out? We, we did. So originally, the first couple years, Kim was really moonlighting as an interior designer. because I she was, was really reticent. It was really hard for me to let go of a steady paycheck, um, moving from my age to something that was iffy. Um, I was really scared about that. I always just had, and I was an expert. People looked up to me. And it was really hard for me to You're switch. going back to the novice now. Yeah, it was really hard for me. Uh, and I got a lot of accolades in my other job. People, just the community. I'll be honest, still some days when I say I was an oncology nurse, people are like, oh my goodness, bless your heart. It feels so good. I have a service part of me. Now I say I'm an interior designer. It, 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 it's hard for me to feel that I'm providing a service. So that was a really hard thing to move away. I got a real good feel good moment in my previous career, but there was a bigger calling also that I wanted. I've always wanted to do something in the creative field. Um, that's why when Emma decided and she needed help raising the children, I think ra helping raise the children fulfills that service part of me. So it's a win win for me being able to take part in my grandchildren's lives and then also being able to uh, create. I wanted to be. So I guess kind of. So I wanted to be behind the scenes person. So kind of, yeah. Kim wanted to be more behind the scenes in the beginning and not necessarily the face of the company. And so she took on the label of creative director. You know, we're a business. We're official. We have to have sure. the title. And I was business development. And I was in charge of networking and marketing first meeting not my forte and meeting with clients up front by myself but some of the conflicts that arose in our relate like our business dynamic was kim is incredibly visual and she doesn't do well with me just reciting and telling a tale of a room and of a client and cuz that's all it sounds like fantasy land and she's and like even when she took photographs of the room it was hard then to feel like the project was my own without walking in the room and even meeting the clients, even though she would describe them and there'd be detail notes. I always felt left out of those projects. If I wasn't part of the introduction, the, the consultation. So okay. yeah, we kind of set up those roles, but now it is since shifted and the two of us meet every client right at the beginning. And then as, you know, Kim still is primarily in charge of the creative direction for every space. And I tend to be more working on business and still kind of acquisition of new business. I am still like more consulting and I'm working alongside her. Um, and when it comes to job site visits, it could be I'll stop by or, you know, when it comes to installs, we're both there, but we're able to balance those roles a lot better now. And it gives our client a lot more reassurance when they see the two of us there that first meeting. I like that too, because you've, you've kind of fallen into where you each can shine and where you feel that, that you are using your skill set to the fullest as opposed to, and, and listen, when we all start, we don't know. You don't know what you don't know. You're figuring it out. You think you want one thing and, and then you go, wait a minute. I thought that's what I wanted, but that's not feeling most comfortable for me. What right. about something else? And so it's very natural and normal. And um, it's inspiring that you each have given the other the ability to grow within the position in the company and to readjust it as opposed to saying, nope, this is how we set it out. Stay in your lane. And some people could easily do, not to say that you don't sometimes have to tell each other, get back <laughs> behind. Not saying that, but you know that you were willing to yeah. say this, let's continue to work on this and balance it out so that we both feel like we are a part of it together and that we're bu building this together. 
Well, right. one aspect that I've been taking the lead on that I never thought I would be doing because I didn't get it at all was our blog. We have a blog that's impeccable. And I didn't even know what a blog was. Emma talked about it early on. I'm like, people are re- writing stuff and people are connected to them and they check into them like a soap opera and read their blogs. <laughs> like, I didn't even know that existed. And I write probably 90% of the blogs now. I love it. Um, Look at all these skill sets you did. <laughs> and even Instagram, I had no idea. And I am like, I do a lot of this. The grid. I love the, the photography and doing the grid and writing all that. And I'm into Instagram. So yeah, I have a whole new skill set. I would have never thought. I would have thought I was just going to make things pretty, come in at the end and say, yeah, move that here and do this and this color. Never thought I'd be doing blogging and Instagram. Don't get me wrong. She still does that. <laughs> like, um, yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. You know what though, Cam? too, it, I think that, as we age, and I'm in my 50s, so I feel like I have the right to say that as we age, it is important to continue to grow and to learn these new skill sets, especially things that are technology-based, because they were not there and they were not available when we were younger. We, I did not learn. I, I went to school and learned computer, you know, technology, yep. that kind of thing. Yep. I, I learned how to code. That was what my job was, yep. development. But it was certainly not the way our kids, they literally two years old can hold an iPad and, and do all right. kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah. Totally and it's not. just not what we learn. Yeah. And so if we don't stay active and cutting edge on those things, those skills go away yep. because they weren't ingrained in us as, as small children. And so I love that you have been willing, even I'm just surprised at yourself. Yeah. Right. And I think that's part of what the mother-daughter team does as well because – Emma can say, here's what we have to do. She's now introduced you to it. If you weren't part of, of the business with her, you would still not maybe know what a blog was unless you just went to read Emma's, you know? And so, right. and I think really, being a mother or daughter, we have a safer environment to learn risk and learn and yeah. make sure our vulnerability. If she was just a friend or a colleague, I probably would stay in my lane more and wouldn't learn that much. But right. since my daughter, I can, sh- likewise, it's just a safer environment for us both, yeah. not only as a sounding board, but much more comfortable to be really real and let down our hair with one another to say, hey, I need some help. And if I'm going to fail, I don't mind failing in front of my mom because I know that my mom would be the one to pick me up, love on me and dust me off and vice uh-huh. versa. It, it's funny. I even sometimes will go shop for my, my mom's amazing. And I would go shop for her and she would be like, you think I can wear that? I'm like, yes, you can wear that. <laughs> yeah. And she would go put it on and she'd come out and she's like, oh my gosh, who would have thought? Look how cute. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm pushing her and she's pushing me because back to what you said at the beginning, it's really about, you know, each other so yeah. well. And I've been doing a lot of research lately into um, our emotions and our awareness of what we're thinking. And when I interviewed Darren Verasami with um, Strengths Finder on the podcast, one of the things that he mentioned, and I'll link that podcast in your podcast, one of the things that he talked about that made business entrepreneurs and owners so great was self-awareness. And, and so understanding your emotions, like what triggers you or what sets you off. We used to call it somebody's pushing your buttons, right? right. Family right. knows how to push your buttons. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know where they are. I could set off every member of my household and all my extended family the minute they walked in the door if I wanted to. And they could do that for me. Yeah. Yes. But, but having that awareness of our emotions and what causes it. Age and maturity certainly does provide it, but the more we look at it and think about it, the more we can harness it and learn when to express it and how to healthily do that or when to hold it back. And so you two probably are going to be able to teach a master class on emotion by the time (laughs) it's all over with, just because you're having to hone that skill to not push each other's buttons when, when you know them so clearly. No, I agree. And one of the things... A, a big, large growing point for me in my late 30s has been, 
you know, not looking at a family member as if they're an adversary, but looking at it as they really want what's best for me, you know, or and someone to outgrow, right? Like, I'm done with you now. You have, I have nothing more to learn. I'm it's, it's about my life now only. Right. And so that's been like my biggest growth point for the past few years is, you know, people complain like, Oh, mothers or mother-in-laws are so critical or they're so this. And it's like, but it, it's not coming from an, a bad place. It's really coming from a place of they want you to overcome this or to be, you know, to be better or you are better than whatever that is. And truthfully, I think that growth within me has really strengthened our relationship and strengthened our business as a result. Right. Because, you know, if you were in business with a, a colleague, not a family member, Mm -hmm. And they gave you constructive criticism. You know, you might take it in general. When I say you, I mean the collective us, right? We may take that very differently than when it's a family member who says it. Yes. I know even in my coaching practice, a lot of the women will say to me, I'm not even going to let my husband know you told me this because when he tells me it makes me angry, but mm -hmm. I can hear it when you tell me. And it's because... Mm -hmm. They feel less than as their, their husband is being adversarial when he's sharing some business principle with them. Mm -hmm. And I would say 9.9 .9 times out of 10, he's actually trying to support them. He's actually trying to lift them up and to give them a skill set. But because of their own internal angst and how they see themselves, they are projecting their, their feelings onto him as he's speaking to them. And we can do that within any relationship. If we're not careful, I remember um, there. One of my favorite Bible verses is "Seek and you shall find," and it really, to me, comes into you're going to always find what you're looking for. Yep. And I would tell my kids when they were little, and they would wake up and oh, this is going to be a crappy day. I was like, "Yes, it is. It's going to be the worst day ever." <laughs> no, and they were no. like, "Mom, why are you saying that?" I said, because if you wake up and walk out the door and say it's going to be crappy, you're going to, everything is going to fit yeah. into that narrative. But if you walk out that door and say, this is going to work and the people that I run into are going to support me and they're going to love me and they're going to cheer me on, you're going to find that because you will always find what you're looking for. And so if we change the mind, now truthfully, there are some people out there who are just mean and cruel and, and yeah. I'm, we're not discounting that. But in general, if you know that your partner, your mom, your spouse, your son, your daughter, whatever relationship, mm -hmm. if you know that they love you and they support you and they want good for you, Emma, like you just described, and you can tell yourself that and be emotionally aware, mm -hmm. then you can receive what they have to say because you've offered them the ability to speak truth into your life. You can take that for, for the, the way that it was meant and then you can actually apply it. Right. But if you come at it like, how dare you say that to me? Every single thing, you're going to be butting heads. Mm -hmm. Right. Or the other one's never going to talk to you because they're going to feel like you're so emotional. You blow up and you're, you know, I can't say anything. And then you get into that whole, you're sensitive. And then that just creates its own set of drama. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We've, got, we've been on both sides of those. But it sounds like I've been sitting in there watching you guys. <laughs> when, you, when you brought up the work and the uh, husband and wife, like a good marriage has is work. It's the same thing with a mother daughter. When people are That's wondering, right. how can you work with your mother? Yeah. You have it's to work. Take, you know, this is the person that I love, but it's going to be a lot of work. And but, some people, they just, you know, you don't want to put in the work and that's fine too. But I think the bigger point that I would like to make about the mother daughter relationship is there has to come a point where you stop. I apologize in advance. Like you stop looking at your mother as if she's your mother. Start looking at your mother like she's a human being, you know. And there comes a point where your mother, the parent, has to look at their child and be like, "Ooh, she's past. She's not fourteen anymore." You know that we've evolved and we're adults. And I find all too often, you know, the reason why people probably can't do the mother daughter relationship thing, at least if they're on the, you know, the daughter or the younger side is they probably still look at their mom as just being a mom, like void of thoughts, feelings, and emotions sometimes. And oh, yeah. I look at my mother and it's like, Oh no, she's like a full blown adult human <laughs> being with her own yeah. experiences, everything and opinions. Like we probably have transcended the mother and daughter. We're in a different plane. 
what probably oh. annoys everybody. <laughs> and it does annoy everybody. But I think, okay, super annoying. interesting. Yeah. You know, sometimes our sons will ask us, so tell me about when you grew up or tell me about this. And they were trying to reconcile the mom and dad that they know us as with humans. And I'll say as a kid, it is sometimes very difficult to look at my parents and think of them having experiences right. to ones I've had. And even the other day, they were making some comment about some new place that opened in our town. And they're like, oh my gosh. And they're like, all these 40 and 50 year old people <laughs> in there hanging out. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're acting like they're in their 20s and 30s. And I looked at him and I said, and what is wrong with 40 and 50 year old people going out and having a good time? In, in in our town like yeah. do you think we should all be sitting at home and for, like what are you thinking <laughs> but because he's in his 20s his thought was that I don't know if he thinks life ends at 30 I mean I don't know what he was thinking right. Right. but he was not looking at us as people he was looking at us as mom and dad and I love that you took time to express that Emma because I I now raising adults and looking at it as they are adults and they're making their decisions and they're making their way. And would I agree with everything they've done and every choice? Nope. But my mom and dad probably wouldn't agree with everyone because they didn't understand it or, or they just didn't agree, but they've got to find their path. And I've got to give them space to let them grow into who they're going to become. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And it's that who we're all becoming. And, and let's be honest, we're going to be becoming until we're dead. Like I am constantly becoming the woman I want to be until I am no more on this earth. I am constantly yep. working to become her. Yep. And I was having a, um, a conversation with another friend yesterday and with my best friend this morning that my best friend has known me for 27 years and she has allowed me to grow from who I was then to who I am now. So she's not forcing me to stay who I was then. She's yeah. loving me and all parts of me, every single aspect of me from that point to now. And that's what I'm seeing with the two of you. And, and I'm hearing you describe is that I loved you back then and I love you right now. And I also love who you're becoming. And I'm going to give you space to, to work that out and figure that out. Mm -hmm. Right. No, with I, safety, right? No, the safety, no, it, not safety. just space, but the safety yeah. of the space. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's no way she can fail because I've always had her back. And, and vice the, versa. And, and now, <laughs> yeah, vice versa. It's like amazing. And just, I just want to, one of the big aha moments, like not only the blog and doing Instagram is, I just welcome this. We've talked about the traditional interior design where you like word of mouth and there was just sort of one way to practice in embracing this blogging and podcasts and going to conferences and learning about meeting your tribe and everybody educating everybody, there's so many fascinating avenues now to interior design that you don't have to be the old model. Even if you were the old model, you can change it now. I'm meeting so many, not only young mothers are blogging and stay at home and making a living, there are people who have been in the trenches in interior design who are now who've learned blogging, who've learned Instagram, and are now going to work into their 60s and 70s um, writing blog posts, teaching podcasts. So everyone's parlaying their businesses for wherever they are. You don't ever have to stop. Right. There's so many different avenues of work. And so I'm really... Uh, excited about all the new adventures out there that this this I never even thought there was an interior design career and now there's so many careers that you <laughs> right 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 oh gosh 30 years ago could you imagine if somebody said well you could be a blogger right make money <laughs> what what are we you still, talking about we watch some of these insta stories you know of people we follow and things we're like can you believe that this is really like this is real life this is what everyone's doing and it's awesome. So people are raising their babies, but they're also retiring comfortably still in their profession. So it's amazing I, I, that we have, I mean, we have so many opportunities now 
and and that okay so let's I'm gonna pull that right back in the same way that you all are allowing each other to grow and to morph as humans it's allowing the business to grow and morph because Absolutely. I can tell you the business that I started in January of 2000 is not the business that I have now in mid 2019 it, it, it's complete I bought companies I've sold companies I've done all kinds of things speaking author you know, podcaster, blogger, I've done all those things. My business has just moved and the fact that it's still moving. Right. And, and that we can allow for that and enjoy that and um, learn. Oh my gosh, I'm still learning. I learn every single day. I learn something. I share it, but I learn like crazy. Yep. Yeah, let I me totally ask you. Yeah, let me ask you this. Um, so what is one of the next big profit goals in your business? Well, we're going to do something really cheesy. There is something big in the works that we can't speak about. Whenever yes. we hear people say that, I'm like, oh, I would love that day that we have something that we can't speak about. But we do have something that is, we hope we'll it, keep you posted. We'll keep you, posted. <laughs> you do that. You do that. Um, follow the blog. It'll all be there. <laughs> but um, we are working on remodeling our house. That's something really big that we're you know, going to turn into a big project for ourselves. We are nice. looking on, you know, some more clients and um, offer some, you know, promote some different offerings for people in our area, some shopping days and really get out and about with that because a lot of people have aired that they struggle with shopping in some, you know, local stores and retail, but are scared to go the designer route. So you know, that's something we're looking to put out there. Offering it's workshops on design and come shop with us. Thrifting. We do a lot of thrifting. And people are like, I don't know what. We'd love to tag along with you. So we're looking to parlay that into workshops. I love it. Kind of bridging that gap and making, yeah. taking some of the scary out of design. So we're trying to keep our ear open of what, the, what people are saying to us. And is that a business opportunity? Got so it being very aware of what things are being said over and over again and thinking, Hmm, could this be something that we can offer people that they would buy? Right. Again, it's a shocker to me that these things are of interest, but they are, they are, they are absolutely. And we're listening to our social media. So we are really active on our Instagram and with our Insta stories and you know, it, it's kind of silly, but it, is fun. You know, we were just stopped at Lowe's the other day and she's like, I know that a woman said, I know that voice. You're the impeccable nest women. And I just love following you. So, you know, we're going to, we're out there as influencers and, you know, promoting good design and, you know, empowering ourselves and women because our tagline is we create interiors that inspire that's impeccable. And it's funny that we are inspiring and, that's what we love to do. So where can people find you? Tell us where your, what your Instagram handle is. We'll have it on the show notes, but give us a shout out for your website and your Instagram. So our website is impeccablenestdesign.com and our Instagram handle is impeccable underscore nest. Perfect. And if you could leave our listeners with one bit of encouragement, what would it be? I'll let you go. Uh, you can uh, each do one. We'll do one from each of you. Okay. You go, Emma. Look at you both pushing off to the I other. Know, I know. <laughs> you do it. Um, I have, like, just stay the course. That's all I can say to people mm. is just keep going because every few months I feel like, oh, my gosh, it's too hard or we're just there. I can feel it. And if we stopped, we would have missed out on a huge opportunity. So That's a good one. just stay the course and keep going. Um, yeah, because it does pay out in the end. And I've listened to so many people say that to us. And I thought it was baloney. Yeah. And here I am saying, it is consistency. It is consistency is absolutely key. Perseverance. Keep, going up, keep doing the hard work. Don't stop. Like, don't just stop. Don't keep stop. learning. Reach out to the community, um, invest in yourself, reinvest in your business. And I think the other thing is be flexible. Really, you need to be flexible. So if there's an opportunity in your social media, you have piles and piles of photos, put it out there on Instagram, on Facebook, 
give, you know, put it out there. Um, it, you know, it's not going to hurt you. Yeah. Um, and, be, and be ready to grab an opportunity where it comes. So you need to always be prepared. Um, Cause one of the, and we did this only once. So we, we learned from it is getting an opportunity. We weren't ready. So uh, that's right. The that, that's such a, a bummer that something comes your way and you're not quite ready to um, grab that, seize on that opportunity. So be prepared, be flexible, and just keep on keeping on. I, I mean, I really, it. really, you just do. I love and, it. And, well, and love your mama. Call your mama. Love your mama. <laughs> love your mama. <laughs> Love your babies and love your mama. <laughs> I love that. It's so funny. When um, when my kids went off to college, I said to my husband, you tell them. They better call their mom. Text me. You tell them. I'm not going to tell them. You tell them for me. I need them to call and text me. Like, I need to hear from them. Yeah. And, um, you know, it took a little bit, but they now they now know if mama text. Yeah. All you got to do is give me a thumbs up that I know you read it and you're okay. Yeah. And, and I can keep moving. But so true. So true. Um, I just have to tell you too, this has been such a delight for me to talk to you. I can see you. I know our listeners can't, they can hear you, but I can see how much you guys adore each other. I can see how much love is between you. And I think that you have really created an inspiring story just by sharing yours that, that these relationships can work. I mean, we could translate mother daughter into sister, sister, yep. translate it into other ways. But when you bring family into work, there is a different dynamic and we need to not ignore it, but to address it and to talk about the challenges of that. I mean, partnerships are one thing, partnerships with family. It's a whole different level of partnership. Right. And I thank you both for being willing to kind of pull back the curtain and share that a little bit. And it's super exciting to see that you're doing it well and that you're both working at it so diligently. Um, and so I can't wait to follow your Insta stories and oh, your blog and see what great big things are coming up for this mother daughter team. Well, thank you very much. Thank Michelle. you so much. Yeah, this was, this was, this was ex it was fun. It was kind of, good. It's it was. actually good to take a look at your business sometimes and talk and about it. You forced us to think, which we don't always do and look back. So thank you yeah, so much for yeah. the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. And this was your first podcast and you guys yeah, did a great no, we're from Sans podcast. But I gotta watch out for old Kim. She might go start her own podcast tomorrow. Now. <laughs> never say guess. Never say never. I was gonna say I would never do a podcast, but I guess my new tagline is "Never say never." That's I mean, right. So you might have a podcast next week. Watch out, Emma. Sorry about that. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Sorry, but I, I'll say this too. I mean, I I'm known as as a business coach and a consultant and advisor who makes people think. If anything, they say to me, oh my gosh, my brain hurts, my brain hurts. Yeah. And so I do send questions in advance to get you thinking so that we are prepared to have a discussion. And I, I've had a lot of guests come back and say, I really appreciated the questions. Not, not so just so that they were right. able to answer, but because yeah. you made me stop and think, remember that one comment? where you started and now where you are and you actually can appreciate where you are so much better when you can understand the journey. And, totally. and then that's why I appreciate you sharing the journey. Totally no, agree. Thank you yeah. so much. It was really great. Yeah. Well, I look forward to following you. And again, I thank you for your time today. Oh, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Have a good one. Yeah. You Thanks. too. Have a good day. Bye. I totally feel the love after that conversation. Don't you? If you're perhaps in a business and you feel alone and you don't have a sounding board, as they mentioned, and you need someone to bounce ideas off of, I invite you to join the designer's inner circle. You can head over to scarletthreadconsulting.com to do that. I have a community that supports, encourages, and propels businesses forward. Let me help you become all that you were destined to be as a business owner. Make the choice to be profitable. It doesn't happen by accident.